back in 96, that's when, uh, that's when a lot of Latinos started to, to, re to register to vote. They found an interest in becoming citizens. Being a former history major, I think one of the biggest things was always being aware of the Latino movement, Chicano movement, and being an administrator, not only an administrator, a teacher, a counselor, I think one of the big things of getting myself into that profession is to see other Latinos like myself become successful and be role models. Well, the movement started because obviously there was a lot of uh, civil rights being violated. That's just the bottom line. And so I, I think when you, you see someone who's a different uh, gender, different color, different creed, uh, you, you're going to treat them differently. One of the first organizations that gave strength to the Chicano movement was the United Farm Workers, like also an organization formed in 1962. This labor union was formed by Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta, and Philip Veracruz. The UFW fought for equality of Mexican-American workers in the agricultural business by using non-blind tactics such as boycotts, marches, and strikes. It was a hybrid of between civil rights movement and labor <laughs> You know, campaign. I helped a little. You know, I volunteered for a bit. <clears throat> but um, with Proposition One Eighty Seven, uh, that that uh, sparked a lot of interest in getting people to become citizens of the U.S. and and then exercise their their political influence by by voting. Have you ever experienced Latino discrimination? Um. Yeah. In college. Oh, uh, what happened? Um, just the attitudes of people thinking that we all are alike and such, and so they kind of categorized us as, you know, eating beans and rice and stuff like that, when in reality, that's not the case. The struggle of Mexican Americans to end discriminatory practices accelerated following World War II. Tejanos, Texans of Mexican descent, lost property rights and political power in a society dominated by Anglos. They were kept at the bottom of the new political and sociocultural order. They continuously experienced discrimination in employment, housing, public facilities, the judicial system, and educational institutions. Many school districts segregated the Anglos and Anglo children into separate facilities. The Mexican schools were grossly underfunded and often offered only a grade school education. In 1930, when 90% of the schools in Texas were segregated, the League of United Latin American Citizens, a Tejano adversary group, supported a court challenge to school segregation. The waitresses just would not come and, and serve us until our coach got up and, and you know, called in the managers and, and then they were very apologetic. The managers were okay, but it's just the waitresses, the way they treated us. And, so we ended up actually not eating there. We got up and left. But, uh, but yeah, that time was very, very obvious that they just wouldn't, wouldn't yeah. have Being an educator, I'm a firm believer that education is a prime example of how to change the culture and how to change society as a whole. In one of our past interviews, uh, this lady said that she witnessed a lot of inequality between men and women in the Latino culture where like the men would look down upon the women. Have you ever experienced that or witnessed something like that? Uh, yeah, the, there is a lot of that. Uh, it's less and less each time, I, I, I would I would say, but uh, it's st there's still a, too much of it, if you ask me. Uh, as a lot of our households, Hispanic households, I mean, we're still stuck in that in that ancient frame of mind where you know the, the male has a certain role, the woman has a certain role, and and if you don't fit into this into their respective roles, then then the woman's look down upon you. You, you, don't, you don't act like a girl. It's a very common thing to say for, for dads to say to their girls. It, it happens a lot. Uh, you mentioned about like the, in the Chicano movement that they look down upon women mm -hmm. and they somehow like, segregate them. Right. Have you ever experienced any? Yeah, that was one of the things that I, I had a, a big um, 
a lot of um, conflict with a lot of individuals at the university. I got involved a lot of with um, you got you guys know how you have ASB here. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So over at the university, they had what they called the associate student body, and it was it's called ASUR. And so I was uh, actually the director of diversity affairs for their mm -hmm. um, cabinet, and um, and I remember that I got to oversee a lot of clubs and organizations on campus that had to do with diversity. I was a sophomore back then, and usually, well, they were used to seeing. If you're a senior or a junior, those are the people that got voted in as president, right? So I remember going up my freshman and sophomore year trying to be elected president, and they got mad. A lot of the guys would come up to me and say, well, don't you know your place? You just got here. Like, that's not the way things work. And I said, well, if you guys were doing something about it, then this we wouldn't be having this discussion, and you wouldn't be considering me as a nominee. So I kind of went up against them, and I ended up getting elected. Uh, there's discrimination, you know, among fellow citizens between uh, Latinos. Can you just reach out? In the service you know? where, um, where one of my uh, co-workers, he was, uh, you know, he was Anglo and uh, we were, uh, I was doing, we were doing some work and uh, he, uh, he came across as, I remember exactly the same story because it happened, what, like over 10 yeah. years ago and, uh, and I remember him saying, you are, you are, you are, because you're Mexican, you have to work, yeah. you have to work more than us, us meaning, you know, white yeah. people, uh, or you have to work twice as harder. Yeah. And uh, I was taken aback at that moment because where is this coming from? Yeah. You know, and I got, you know, I got mad right away because I didn't, you know, I, I was a slacker in the service. So I, mm -hmm. I stopped him at that moment and, and I told him, look, uh, you know, I respect who you are. But if this continues, I'm going to lose my respect for you. And uh, and after that moment, uh, I noticed that he had a change in his in his uh, in his behavior toward me. But I wanted to serve my country like everybody else. Yeah. Right. So, have you ever experienced discrimination? Um, when I was actually in high school, um, I was told by my counselor that I couldn't go to USC. I think part of it was because I'm Hispanic mm -hmm. and uh, my background, so. That was my sophomore year, mm -hmm. and I kind of took it as a, as a challenge to prove her wrong. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, it didn't hold me back. It was kind of discouraging, but it actually, I found power from it because I was able to overcome her lack of, of tr trust in me and my ability. To leave my room. I hated going to class sometimes. I think by the second year I was there, I wanted to leave the university. And I saw half of my friends drop out by the end of my freshman year in college because of that um financial hardships was part of it and and then the, it didn't help that people were so rude in me so yeah the Chicano student movement formed as a result of the educational inequalities that mexican americans faced during this time period many schools in america were segregated and as a result mexican american students were not receiving quality education in their schools the Chicano student movement began as an organized collection of high school and college age students they fought for educational inequalities in their community by asking for better textbooks more chicano teachers in their schools better educational services, and classes that related to their own Chicana history and movement culture. It became known as Metro. Student movement of Chicano, and then it's a place in your college website. Okay. But you That's can look good. it up. It's yeah. a very political period. the segregation of their children in so-called Mexican schools, where teachers severely punished Mexican-American students for speaking Spanish in the classroom. Most Latino children were denied access to formal schooling, and the few who received instruction attended segregated schools. Despite early attempts to desegregate classrooms, the invasion was based on the technicality that the term white was there for segregation. In Cisneros vs. Corpse Christi Independent School, change was made when the court declared Mexican Americans to be an indefinable ethnic group to desegregate public schools. However, the jour segregation would still find a way to remain present. Soon, Brown would pave a way for improving the educational experiences for Latinos. The Bilingual Educational Act also a monetary resource and developed instructional resource for Latinos. The most significant contribution was the promotion of multicultural education. Despite Brown's attempts, educational experience of Latino students remained unequal. Their efforts transformed America's understanding of what was meant by civil rights. Yeah. 
kids who were much lighter skinned, which shunned me and made me feel like I wasn't, like I was less than them. I was yeah. in fear, you know, by calling me, you know, Indio, calling me Negro, you know, things like that. Um, mm. I mean, we were kids, but, but then you grow, you, you, you grow old and you question, well, these, you know, these kids had to learn from someone and, and the first teachers of children are their parents.